Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Christina Chu, and I am one of the key account managers for our financial institution partners in Victoria and South Australia at Western Union Business Solutions. Today, I am joined by the CEO and founder of Frollo, Gareth Gumbly. Frollo is a purpose-driven fintech that is an Australian leader in open banking. Also joining us today is leading broadcaster and TV presenter, Chris Urquhart, who will be conducting this insightful interview with Gareth today. Welcome Gareth and Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much, Chris. Christina, thank you so much for, uh, for, for introducing us this afternoon. And a big warm welcome to everyone who's watching and joining us this afternoon on the webinar. Um, did you have a couple of final remarks, Christina, before we get underway? Yes, I do. Okay. Today's webinar topic is on how and why your FI can use open banking to compete. As major financial institutions have started to announce their data recipient plans, Now's the time for FIs to start thinking about using open banking to compete and stay ahead of the market. At Western Union Business Solutions, we constantly look for ways to simplify and optimize payments and have welcomed the changes that open banking represents. Competition is healthy and open banking gives consumers more choice, freedom and control over their payments. As a matter of fact, we've added new partners to our ecosystem to help our clients leverage this opportunity and have been for a while offering new capabilities in this area. In Europe and the UK, we have partnered with Klarna, formerly Sopor, a real-time bank transfer payment method that allows users to remit funds directly from their bank accounts. Klarna works with our global pay for students platform and is available in British pound, Euro in the UK, Germany, Italy, Spain, Belgium, France, and Austria. Before we get started, a reminder to switch the screens to full view and close any apps and documents you may have for an optimal webinar experience. You can ask questions using the Q&A tab located on the bottom of your screen. Thank you and over to you, Chris and Gareth. Fantastic. Thanks, Christina. And once again, a big warm welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon and a big warm welcome to you as well, Gareth. And, and as Christina mentioned a moment ago, if you are joining us this afternoon, you've got a burning question that you want to ask Gareth, please let us know using the Q&A tab and we'll do our best to get to your questions as well as mine throughout the next hour or so. Um, but I thought we'd start at the very beginning. Many of you who have joined us this afternoon will be very, very familiar with the concept of open banking. But Gareth, for those that aren't, break it down for us. Open banking, what do we mean when we're talking about this as a concept? Yeah, so as a concept, it sort of comes from the, um, I guess, a frame of reference that consumers own their own data. And for a long time, banks have felt that that is their IP and their intellectual property and theirs to use, you know, to provide the best service they can to the customer. And the, and the world of open banking is really saying, actually, we need to we need to empower the customer to be able to share their data with somebody else. And and the fundamental driving force behind that is to bring more competition into the market. So it's brought about by government, the ACCC and Treasury to say, actually, here, consumer, you can have your data and you can share it with whoever you like. And, and the organizations that are called data recipients, those that collect it in a simple manner, um, can then build, build a, a use case or an experience for a customer which says, share your data with me and I can deliver you a better outcome. And that outcome, lots of different ways that, that outcome can be expressed. But in simple terms, it's bank sharing data, you know, with another organization and the consumer having freedom to, to really um, use that to get better outcomes for themselves. Yeah, well, there's so much about this topic that we're going to unpack this afternoon when it comes to open banking and particularly the, the benefits that can flow from it for, for financial institutions. Um, but I'm really interested in your own organization to kick off with, Gareth. Tell us a little bit about Frollo. What is it that you actually do? Where did the idea come from in the first place? Sure, sure. There's a few things there. But um, so to, to kick it off, look, we're a purpose-driven fintech. So, you know, our, our tagline, if you like, is to help people feel good about money. And, and that comes from the, I guess, the, the research that I did when I started, you know, with the napkin idea at the dining table of, you know, can I build a business and what do I want it to be and what should we tackle? 
And what I felt was important was that financial well-being was really not um, understood by individuals or organizations all being um, targeted. So, you know, the number one cause of relationship breakdown is money, you know, is people's, you know, um, you know, I don't know fear of money or um, desire and greed of money, you know, or, and, or just two different perspectives on money. And that, um, that sort of, you know, comes from this um, perspective that 50% of the population, you know, live from paycheck to paycheck. They don't really have enough capacity to be able to deal with the unexpected item that comes to their life. They'll need to deal with it with another form of credit to be able to deal with that. And so what I wanted to be able to solve for was if consumers um, had more educational tools and techniques that help them manage their finances better before they get to the point where they're taking on debt. So could we help them you know, build the savings required to get their first home? Could we help them reduce the debt you know, that they're dealing with? Could we help them build an emergency fund that, uh, that really means at the end of each month, should the car rego come up and you, you forget about it like you always do, you know, you've got enough capacity to be able to deal with that. So that was the, the underlying uh, drive for me was, well, can I try and solve that problem? And then, and then how we went about building that as Frollo was really to... Um, start to look at using data to deliver better experiences for consumers. And so we started our business using screen scraping, which is a method of gathering your bank data and, and collecting it, um, always with a view on the future, which was open banking. You know, so we, you know, we knew we needed to build towards an open API environment. And that was you know, building features that say, we can aggregate your finances, we can show you how to save better towards a goal, we can help you pay down your debt. We can help you almost, you know, see which financial products, you know, are better for you. So that was that was really what I wanted to achieve. And then in in our experience in that, now we, you know, we are the, the leading open banking provider, you know, in Australia. You know, we we process over ninety five percent of all open banking APIs, you know, are, are running on our platform. Um, we have, you know, a tier one bank signed with us, ANZ are signed with us to build their journey. We can get into some of these things and what what are they doing with us. You know, as we get along, but you know, the organisation is you know primarily using data to deliver better personal finance experiences for consumers, and that's that's really you know really what we do all day and every day, and we're very passionate about that. And I'm imagining in in those early days before open banking had been mandated and and been regulated, you were probably pretty limited in what you could do in order to achieve those those big goals, right? In 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 the for, in the you know the early years of, of Frollo. Yeah, yeah, no, it was very much, you know, three blokes sitting under the arches in North Sydney, um, you know, hoping that we could, you know, convince people that this was a great idea and lots of lots of trying to sell, you know, the business, you know, through through a PowerPoint. But ultimately, we put a, a consumer app into the marketplace, a B2C app, which we have out there now, which is, you know, about 140,000 people use that every day to see see their finances clearly understand, you know, as I explained, understand where their money is going and, and we nudge them to deliver better experiences, you know, in terms of how they could make their money go that little bit further um, and provide them insights around that. So that, that, that was a, you know, a slow progress through screen scraping into open banking and now very much partnering with banks to deliver those experiences for them. Yeah, well, tell us how the game's changed for you and, and, and what has flowed in these, these last couple of years. Uh, open banking really got underway in Australia, what, July last year. Um, what has, what's happened in this, you know, first year? We're coming up to 12 months now. Yeah, the last, it's been quite a ride in the last 12 months, actually. So, um, so much going on, but mostly because, you know, the, uh, we had four data holders in at the very beginning. So we had, um, you know, we had the big four banks and then Frollo and the Regional Australia Bank consuming, consuming the data. So that the last year has really been about mostly for the banks. It's been about getting their own data holder capabilities right. So you know all of the tier two banks and tier three banks now are obligated to share data from July one, um, twenty twenty one. So this year, um, and that, so the last twelve months for us has been you know testing the big four banks, um, building out experiences where you know their APIs just didn't work or we didn't get the right piece of data that we expected. It was in the wrong field. Um, it could be that they had to bring on more products, you know, so joint accounts is something that's only just come into effect. So we've, we've been very much focused on getting the, essentially the base infrastructure just working better. Um, and, 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 and probably the majority of our time would then also be on education. 
you know, it's just helping people understand what is open banking, how can it apply to our business, what can we do with it, where are the opportunities, and and you know they also move very much through a big fear. You know, there was a you know I think you you know we talked about it pre this session, but you know what was what were the big four banks worried about coming into open banking, and you know maybe the fear for everybody with open banking is well I'm now exposing my data, so you know am I going to lose customers? I'm going to retain customers. What's the opportunities? that are around it. So this year has been about educating that, you know, this is not something to be frightened of. This is a fantastic opportunity to deliver better experiences for your end consumer. And, and, and you know, how do we go about doing that? That's that's really where we're at now. This this next 12 months is, you know, driving into that, I think. And I guess the, the, the lessons that you've probably learned, those institutions learned in that first year, actually is going to make things much easier for the other data holders. And I know there's probably data holders, people from organisations that are data holders in our audience today, the journey perhaps will be a little bit easier for them um, with the knowledge of, of, of what's been learned by yourself in, in, in the last 12 months, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we've seen that in, you know, we've brought a number of the new data holders into the ecosystem. So we, we help test their platforms and test their systems um, to bring them live. And we know the ones that we worked with uh, have had a much better and smoother experience. So we're able to take them into, into our app and take them live into market where they're sharing data much quicker. Have um, those, so, have, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Gath. I was, I was oh. gonna ask, have the teething problems largely been ironed out or is there uh, is there a fresh new set of problems that, that, that is being encountered all the time as we as we delve more, more deeply into the possibilities with, with the open banking so far? I think to be to be blunt about it, you know, every every bank system is incredibly complex, right? And they they're largely organic environments that have matured over time with different um, different products that have been offered, customers on legacy products, customers on new products. You know, the data isn't always clean, and so we're always encountering new um, exceptions. You know, the ones that aren't working. You know, so getting the eighty percent working well. I think we have that. I think we have probably pretty good experience of that. But that last 20% is where we start to get problems. So, you know, somebody with a with a joint account, with an old product, you know, maybe that API doesn't work as we'd expect it to. It doesn't behave in the manner we expected. And so as we add more customers onto our platform, we discover more of these customers with, you know, slightly quirky products or, you know, quirky settings, setting their personal profiles. All of these things can throw the APIs out that just haven't been tested because they're, you know, essentially edge cases. So what, what we should see in the next 12 months is more ADRs like Frollo that are consuming data from a data holder will allow us to test the breadth of the experience, will allow us to test its performance. And I think we'll start to see a lot more, um, a lot more um, issues, but, you know, you know, they're quickly remedied, I would say. They're not, they don't hang around for a long time. It's not, a, it's not a slow moving environment that we're in. Everybody's running at breakneck speed you know, fixing things all the time. We just have a, a little bit more um, structure and solidity with the big four. And now we'll have a year of, um, you know, with the, the tier twos and the tier threes of teething problems with their technology providers, whether they're in-house or external partners. It's extraordinary that Frollo was first out of the blocks with this. It must have been a big sense of pride for you in the, you know, in the business that you've built. But what, what is it about Frollo? Do you think that, it, you know, the, the, the planets aligned or your hard work aligned in order to be the first with this 12 months ago? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to go back and reflect on that. Mm -hmm. Only, um, you know, we did, it was a bit like, you know, there was a lucky draw, right? Everybody was like, who wants to try open banking? And so we, we filled an application form in late one night, one of the guys did, and we threw it in and, you know, we didn't hear anything for months. And then all of a sudden we get a tap on the shoulder saying, come to Melbourne, you need to be live in the next, you know, 60 days or something. And it was, come on, that's ridiculous. Um, you know, but and we were sort of excited and terrified at the same time. Um, but what we did, you know, was, you know, I think we always fundamentally believed that this approach of sharing data would deliver better outcomes. So we were excited. So we just tipped all of our resources. We put everything into open banking and said, okay, well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have a single focus and a big bet, then let's make it open banking and let's try and do it and do it right. And sadly, you know, the complexity and the challenge of it, um, you know, other organizations fell away because they just ha didn't have the operational maturity that we had. We, you know, we had, you know, one other thing, um, Chris, that was useful was that we'd been working with big banks already and um, neo lenders and neo banks, and therefore we had built a lot of the requirements for open banking, which are policy, process, 
compliance, ISO accreditation, you know, all these things that banks look for before they deal with you were things we'd already done. So when the government said, have you got all these things? We were fortunate to be able to say, oh, well, this piece of paper, this piece of paper, this piece of paper. So for us, it was much more about technology and less about process. And for others that have come through that are following in our footsteps, it's probably been a little bit more about process and policy and less, you know, as well as technology, which just means it takes time, right? That's, you know, so that's that's probably the, you know, the good fortune that we had on our side in this. Um, the open banking journey in Australia has a series of milestones, a series of, of date targets um, that need to be met. Obviously, you know, the, the first one, I suppose, was July last year, but we've just ticked over the latest milestone on 1st of July this year. What's what's changed now and, and, and what needs to have occurred and what are we seeing in, in the, the first couple of weeks of, of, of the next phase of open banking in Australia? Sure. So, so this next phase is the, the tier twos and threes really starting to share their data. Um, what, what has happened is we've probably got 20 odd um, data holders now that are live that have, you know, that are actually, you know, we're, we're testing and getting data from and building experiences off, but we still have about another 70 to go, right? So there's probably 90, you know, ADIs, data holders that we expect to be providing data in, in the future. And, you know, a lot of those are working on remediation plans with the ACCC. The, you know, this, I, I called it out um, earlier. I mean, it, it's complex. You know, what we're asking the banks to do is take all of your information that's fragmented and distributed across systems and make it available to us in a couple of simple APIs. And most of them hadn't brought that information together in the first place. So, you know, that, you know, that presents a challenge. And that is, you know, what we're seeing now is that some of the smaller FIs and, and even a few of the bigger ones are just struggling and wrestling with that complexity um, before they can bring the data into the ecosystem. So this year we'll see a lot of staggered rollouts over the, over the next 12 months of banks coming on or groups of banks coming on if they're sitting on a technology, a particular technology provider. So that they're, they're things that we'll see. So big milestone really is um, for me, you know, progressive through this year, July 22 is when everybody should be there. I don't think there'll be any excuses for everyone to be there. And July 22 is when everybody will have all data being shared. So today, you know, we want um, transaction data, um, savings data, credit cards, but mortgages and joint accounts, you know, won't be available for some time in those, in those tier twos and threes. So does that make sense? So it's really about, you know, we've got a really rich data set in, um, in the tier, tier ones, you know, in the big ones. And then in the, in the, the second tier, you know, really is progressive for the next 12 months. So July 22 for me is when we really have everything available to us in, you know, read only capacity. And then the next big milestones that we'll be talking about will be, um, you know, how do we get more people into the ecosystem? How do we get, we could talk about that. I think it's specific, it's important. And how do we get, um, how do we get right access, you know, the ability to initiate a transaction, whether that be a payment or whether that be opening a bank account on someone's behalf. That's for me when the game changes, you know, when we move from read to write, then we're actually able to effect change rather than um, nudge people to do something. We can actually say, we will do that for you. And that's powerful, right? Has it been too short a period for, for customers and the customer end to start to see some of the innovation as a result of this, or is it really still very much in, in the experimental phases? Has the, the, the banking experience, the, 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 the switch experience, whatever it happens to be, changed already for customers, or is that only going to come down the track? Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to come down the track. So I think, you know, if, if I talk about, you know, we really are the primary use case in market, you know, you know consuming most of the APIs. And that is in a, in a money aggregation sense. So the ability for people to share um, with us their banking data, and we can bring all of that into one place. So ComBank's announced open banking strategy, you know, one pillar of that will be the same feature, you know, the ability to be able to log into your ComBank app and see all of your bank um, money in one place. Um, and that's the, that's the first experience that's there. That's not, um, you know, big and live in public, it's in beta in beta at the moment and you know so we'll see these what i would call proof of concepts occurring over the next 12 months we've got a number you know we announced one yesterday with pnn bank um you know for them to you know to provide them a financial companion app you know an app that does personal finance features that's open banking powered that you know has a lot of the features you see today and frollo will be available for pnn customers um 
those kind of experiences you'll start to see over the next 12 months. But, you know, I think, you know, definition of success for open banking is not that my dad knows what open banking is, you know, is that, you know, he participated in an experience that uses open banking. So he told me, you know, he can now see, you know, in his building society account in the UK, he can now see his NetWest bank account, you know, that, um, or his lawyer's bank account, you know, he, he, you know, that was his experience, but he didn't know he was doing it. That's what I do, right? That's, you know, that's what I do every day, but he just knew that that was a, a feature that was available to him. And that's, for me, that's really what success looks like is, you know, users, you know, consuming um, APIs, um, not necessarily knowing that, you know, there's an awareness of what open banking is. Yeah, which I think points back to the original goal that we talked about that you had when you, you first started the whole thing many years before all of this technology and these changes, regulatory changes has made it possible. So standing on the next tier now, we're talking credit unions, other mutuals, other you know smaller non-big four banks that uh, are, are on the precipice of this right now. What are the big opportunities that they've got um, ahead as a result of, of engaging with and participating with um, this, this change? We, yeah, we, we recently did some research, you know, out to out to consumers to better understand what are they most excited about. And, you know, we found from that that, you know, two in three consumers would be willing to, you know, switch switch banks even to get open banking features. You know, so, you know, there was a, um, you know, there is a willingness to start to say, OK, well, I want better and I want more features and I want more capability. So the opportunity, I think, is, you know, a mindset which is not defend, but it's a mindset which is compete. So, if you were in a position where you could see your whole of customers wallet, you know, essentially where all of their financial um, life, where, where is their entire financial life, then you can start to build experiences that bring them back to you more fully, particularly with, you know, a lot of the member base, you know, tier twos and credit unions are, you know, they're, they're member driven, you know, they're all that customer owned and driven, you know, the language is the same, but the, um, the, you know, the concept is we really, really believe we want to deliver a better outcome for you and you know you might not be getting the best deal with the big four and we can show you that you're not getting the best deal with the big four then they've got the biggest brand they've got the biggest marketing but they might not have the best experience they might not have that relationship or personal trust so i think the opportunity is to to engage with the customer to get more share of wallet um, build experiences that are truly meaningful and impactful in their lives you know so you, you have the brand credibility to be able to say we want to do something right for you then back that up with experience, right? So in the past, you, you know, organizations have struggled with technology to be able to get data in, you know, they struggle to see their own data. What open banking does and with partners and organizations like ourselves, you know, we have the capacity to present that information to you in a really simple fashion with a single API that's already provided the insights around that financial data is, you know, we've categorized it. We, tell, we can tell you what it is. We can tell you what shop they've used it for. We can tell you how many times they've been a year you know, whether it could support a lending decision for you, you know, all of these things are data points that were, you know, really easily consumed now in this new world that previously would have been a huge, you know, um, you know, technology, you know, roadblock, you know, in front of you. So I think they're some of the things that, you know, we can start to see the banks, um, you know, and the TTs really being able to embrace. So much opportunity and possibility. And a big reminder for anyone who is joining us on this webinar this afternoon, if you do have a question for Gareth that uh, you feel like ha I haven't gotten to so far, feel free to add it in the Q&A panel um, of, your, uh, of your Zoom window there. And we'll do our best to get to all of your questions throughout the rest of the webinar. I'm really interested in, you, you touched on lending there um, for, for, for a moment, which is for a regular consumer, perhaps the biggest interaction they're ever going to have with their financial institution. Um, there's a lot of inefficiencies, though, in, in, in mortgage lending, right, for, for consumer um, to, to kind of deal with. What sort of practical things is, is open banking likely to be able to, to resolve to deliver a better customer experience? Well, there's a couple, a couple of things that, that, you know, really jump out as opportunities, right? That, you know, whenever you're going to a lending decision, you typically got to provide facts, facts, you know, we'll call it fact finder, right? You know, in that might be proof of income, it might be proof of expenditure, it could be your identity. And what open banking will provide us is we can start to fill in the application form automatically, you know, almost auto magically, you know, with APIs, you know, with the, the data coming in and doing that. So we can pick up from open banking, what product do you have today, your name, your address, um, you know, we can add in, you know, what your income is, all of your expenditure, and even highlight risk items that may, 
um, expedite the opportunity to have a conversation with the end consumer, whether that be through a mortgage broker, which is a, you know, a channel where, you know, you speak to your broker, the broker asks you for some information, broker takes that to the lender, the lender says, oh, that there's something missing here, you know, there was a, you know, salary payment was late, you know, um, can I have another bank statement, go back all the way through. And, you know, each one of those interactions costs the bank hundred bucks, right? You know, 200 bucks. You know, there's, it's really inefficient for end consumer friction, um, broker inefficient, you know, they'd rather have more, inef more efficiency in the process. And then for the lender, they, you know, they really want to get a customer on, you know, onto the system as quick as possible. So for me, you know, that's one of the areas, you know, where we'll see, you know, the ability to gather data quickly initially will be to support a lending decision, like a yes, no, you know, quicker time to yes. In the future, it will be a quicker decision to switch. So, you know, in, a, in an open banking world, you have all of the data you need and all of the information you need to be able to make an assessment decision on the customer real time and make them a refi offer, you know, on the fly or, you know, tease them away from a bank because you can see that they're over there, they're on, you know, 2.3% with Combank, you've got an introductory at 199 you know, let's, let's have a conversation. You know, we don't need to, you know, we're not asking you to sell, you know, we'll buy from us now, but we are saying that we will always make sure you're on the best rate all of the time. And we're starting to see that from the neo lenders like Athena, you know, we're doing that kind of, you know, price matching capability, you know, we'll always be the best rate in town. That capability there is, I think, available for, you know, for the tier twos as well. Um, when businesses think about open banking data, um, what do you think are the most important things that, that they need to consider about it? Well, you know, so the two things I think super important. Right? Um, first one is really clear what you want to get from it. So don't go into um, any, I mean, don't go into any project without clear, clear success criteria. So what is, what is your use case? Why do you want to use open banking? What problem is that trying to solve? Is it trying to remove friction? Is it trying to create opportunities? You know, you want to do cross-sell, upsell. So be really clear on what that, you know, help with financial well-being, you know, that would be great. You know, if, you know, help fill in a hardship form for a customer, you know, you know, use open banking data to populate it. So be clear on what the use case is, make it um, small enough and manageable enough that you can demonstrate success really quickly. And, you know, look out to the market for reference points, you know, partners that can help accelerate that, um, that proof point for you to build the business case to be able to get, you know, to where I believe everybody should be, which is strategically investing into open banking and recognize that every organization has, you know, its own gates that they need to get through for funding. But I, I think that, you know, the, the key success is, you know, demonstrate success really quickly, find a quick win, get a use case, be really clear about what that looks like, and then start executing on that. Um, I imagine that for, for a lot of people, a lot of businesses, you know, they're, they're with a financial institution and they stay with that FI for many, many years because it's, it's too difficult to switch, it's too difficult to change. Um, what does this mean for customer retention? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing one of the questions that's come in here, because I think is, is the idea that unless um, institutions innovate with this, they will in fact lose customers to other financial institutions that are embracing it? I think so. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a tech evangelist, I guess. I'm, I'm kind of at the forefront of this. So, you know, I, I accept I have a biased, um, a biased view on this. But, uh, you know, what, what I think is the big difference is that the world of banking previously was opaque, right? They, you know, in, whether that be applying for credit, I never know if I'm going to get a yes or no until the computer spits it back out. I'd love to know, you know, that I'm going to get a yes before I apply. And then for sure, I would have switched banks, you know, years ago. You know, the only reason that stops me is, you know, this opacity, you know, this opacity that exists and, and that we just don't know that we're not on the best deal. You know, I know because I'm, you know, fascinated in this space. So I'm watching and seeing, you know, what rates are being offered, who's offering the best deal, where are the hidden T's and C's, you know, the, the terms that underlie, you know, savings account are complex for consumers. And they often miss out. We, you know, we've done studies on that. It's one in 10 consumers successfully gets their bonus rate every month, right? So, you know, most people miss out because they're just not aware of what goes on. And I think that's where I think a brand that is willing to be, um, you know, transparent and um, bold and steps into this space has the opportunity to take market share. And, you know, and if you can remove friction in the process, for sure, you know, you're onto a winner. And that's, so if, if the banks don't embrace this um, themselves, then the fintechs will, 
and and the fintechs will do that on a on a narrow basis right they'll they'll specialize in an area and take a big chunk of pie you know like after pay and credit cards they just went okay really really narrow i'm just going after this um and i think that's what happens you know so we'll see we'll definitely see impact on retention and we'll see impact in um, innovation which will create opportunities so better to be in the boat than um on the side you know <laughs> trying to swim Good metaphor. Um, I'm curious about this. We've talked obviously about a lot of the benefits for that will flow to customers, a lot of the benefits that, you know, will, will flow to, to, to FIs that in, embrace this and also the risks of not doing so. But I'm really curious, just purely as a, as a, as a consumer, as a, as, a, as a bank customer, we put so much faith in, in data security and data safety, you know, with, in terms of our banking, our finances, all of that sort of thing. Um, does open banking put at risk um, the, 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 uh, you know, our data in a way that, that it hasn't previously been at risk? No, I think, it, I think it's a much more secure, more trusted, transparent way to share data. So, you know, a great example I use is, you know, when I wanted to refinance my house and, you know, a mortgage, I rang my broker um, and spoke to him and I said, I couldn't remember what, I didn't have my bank statements of when I applied. And he said, um, oh, don't worry, I've got those in the car. You know, so this was three years later, I was looking at a refi and he had my file in the boot of his car, you know, in a, in a you know, ready to help me through my financing process. The, the process of open banking sharing data is you give explicit consent to each piece of data that you share and for an explicit purpose. So you can't, there, there is not this, you know, kind of Google world where you say, oh, I, I accept and you can have all my data and you can do whatever you like with it. And I really don't mind. I just, that's fine. In open banking, it's I'm going to ask for your name. I'm going to ask for your transaction details, your bank balances. I'm going to ask every day about this for the next three months. And after that three months, I'm going to stop asking unless you contact me and say you would like me to continue to share. You'd like to continue to share data. So it, it's an express, um, an express consent for an express period of time for an express purpose. And then you, you know the underlying protection is that the moment you say I don't want to continue to share data with Frollo or with ComBank, you click, you know, a little slider in your banking app or in the Frollo app, either you can go either place and you say, I don't want to, I don't want to share anymore. And all of that data is deleted and it just, everything is gone, you know, it just completely wiped out. So you've got transparency in terms of where you're sharing, how it's being used and your ability to withdraw it at any point in time that suits you. So for me, it's, it's really, um, it's really the preferred way of, a data exchange for me as a consumer and for you, Chris, you know, you should know that, the, you know, it's safe in that sharing. The, the other thing that undersits this is, you know, the, you know, the accreditation required, you know, we spoke about it at the top of the interview, about how difficult it was to, you know, for us to get through that, you know, I mean, we're effectively being treated like a bank to be able to get access to that data. And, and today we would trust the bank to share that information. So we're sharing it in a digital form. We're no longer passing bank statements around or allowing someone to screen scrape, who knows what they're scraping, for how long are they storing it and what are they doing? You know, we're getting to a really clear and um, friendly environment. So I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, and as a follow up to that, it actually kind of links in with one of the questions that we've had submitted through because the onus very much on the customer to be in control of their data. The question um, that's come in is, is along the lines of whether the government needs to drive a bit more education uh, to consumers about open banking, um, given that they, we may create a huge amount of supply in terms of this area, but not driving the demand from the consumers of them realising what's possible for them um, if they opt in to you know what their financial institution is offering in this space well i think yeah okay yeah i mean there's a couple of a couple of things on that i think that, i mean the first is um i don't i don't think there's any point in a mass consumer education program right you know a, a tv advert that says use open banking the consumer data rights exciting it's very powerful and i've been really explicit with you know government on this i think you know putting funding into developing use cases um, has been used in the uk very successfully you know, so funding ideas, funding innovation, solving pain points is what's going to get the take up. You know, there was a great um, business in the UK that helped, you know, for people wanting to get um, to get a mortgage, but they'd only ever done renting in their life. Right. But so they've got a real credit record. So there was a recognition that in using open banking data, you could see regular payments. You could see that there was effectively a virtual credit reference there that could be used to support a mortgage application. 
and the, the government funded that, right? They put millions of pounds into that um, fintech to support them to build the use case, which was then then subsequently adopted. So I think there there is much more, which really sort of leads into the second part of my answer, which is, you know, the, the, it's for us to create demand, right? It's for us to come up with the ideas to look at our systems and see the inefficiencies. We know consumers want to be able to see all of their finances in one place. You know, that is our business. You know, we, we you know, we're larger in customer base than, you know, some small banks. And so we know that there's demand there. We know that they want us to switch, help them identify where they can switch products. There's big comparison sites out there that tell us that every day, you know, the can stars and the finders of the world are, uh, you know, taking our money to, or taking money to switch you. Um, so there are opportunities that we can create through open banking, you know, in a more friction with less friction in the process. So I think demand is there. What is, what is required is, um, confidence to make an investment make those you know make those small bets you know to build up to your big bet uh, to be able to go after open banking but for me you know it's now really on you know uh, industry and you know consumers really to drive demand you know or, and demand better outcomes you know if we demand that you know that'll be that'll come through to us so i think i think it will come through Fantastic. And appreciate the question that's submitted there as well. And if you've got a question of your own this afternoon, make sure you let us know on the Q&A tab. Um, I'm interested as well, you mentioned the UK experiences briefly there before. There are other economies, other countries that are a little bit further down the road in terms of open banking than Australia is, and there are others still that are lagging uh, behind us. What have we learned here in Australia? What have you learned in terms of the experience of, uh, of, of, say, the UK that's a little bit further down the road in terms of this stuff than, than we are? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that the UK got right was to build a, a tiered accreditation model. So in Australia, it's kind of big bang. You have to be like Frollo, which is that you, you're entirely unrestricted in your um, movements of what you can do with open banking. But equally, the hurdle to get over to become an un unrestricted data recipient is pretty significant unless you're a bank already. So, you know, what, what we have proposed in the rules now with Treasury, you know, and, you know, FinTech, you know, FinTech Australia and us are, you know, really proponents of is to be able to bring in a, a lower level of accreditation where we can enable other organizations to develop use cases. They might be smaller FinTechs, neo lenders, make it easier to get access to the APIs and get access to the data still in a secure and trusted environment, still all, with all those protections we discussed earlier, but all of a sudden you've got this multiplier effect, then you've got more people out on the street, you know, trying to create innovation, you know, and stand up organizations, you know, an organization like Frollo, we can't do 50 open banking implementations in a year. We need more competitors in the market, you know, actually will drive us, you know, to deliver better, it will drive opportunity, but it will drive the, you know, fundamental, you know, CDR ecosystem as well. So. That for me is one of the things UK got right. The other thing they got right was the ability to do right access. So you can actually use open banking in the UK to move money. So I could log into my Frollo app in the UK. I could um, transfer money from CBA to NAB. I'm not in either of those experiences, but I'm using my open banking consent to say, I'm happy for Frollo to initiate a transaction from there to there. So if you think about that in an open banking world, then that means I could actually initiate a transaction to pay my gym membership, you know, or the gym could initiate that transaction and it wouldn't need to use credit cards. It could use a, a cheaper form of payment um, to, to effect that transaction. And Australia is just slower in the embracing right access, the ability to move money than, you know, just read only, if that makes sense. So they're things we could learn. Things we did right were having much um, wider data sets, much deeper data sets available. So, you know, the fact we have mortgage data, you know, the UK didn't have that. So they, they started with just transaction savings, which meant it was very difficult for them to build um, high value use cases. They can only build low value use cases, which were, I can move money from A to B, if that makes sense. So it's a combination of both of those things, you know, that we'll start to see, um, you know, learnings that are applied to Australia and you know, we know government are listening. I just, you know, I think that's probably where they missed it in the first in the first round. They were so concerned about keeping it tight, you know, that they didn't, you know, they didn't imagine, you know, what was required to get momentum. Does that right access? Sorry, Gareth. Does that does that right access idea need to come from government, as in the you know the the regulation law around it needs to change in order for that to happen? 
Well, Scott Farrell was the initial, you know, author, if you like, of the consumer data right in Australia, you know, governed, you know, um, author, you know, sent by, um, you know, the Australian government to go around the world, find out what's best practice. And, and he came back with this, you know, the, the hypothesis number one, which was open it up, open it across ecosystem, across industries, you know, so we, we will be into, you know, energy shortly and telco and insurance and super and all those things will get covered under our rights, which everybody else is catching up on. But we did miss this right access and we did miss this tiered accreditation. And they're very much in the next wave of activities that we're dealing with at the moment with government. So it's, you know, what I would say is that the ACCC and Treasury, you know, are listening. Everybody has a voice. Everybody on the call has a voice. You know, if you have an opinion, um, you know, air it, find ways, you know, you can come through us, you can go through FinTech Australia, you can go direct through um, the ACCC and Treasury. But, but really, you know, lift your voice because, you know, they're the things that will accelerate the adoption of these enablers to get momentum into open banking. And that's, um, you know, that participation is increasing on a, you know, on a monthly basis, I would say. But it was pretty, you know, in that first year you asked me, it was pretty quiet, you know, out there um, for us, you know, and I think that's what we need now is now most people are being, you know, um, you know, have been, you know, coerced in as data holders. Now, you know, open your eyes and, and start to see where the opportunities might lie. Could financial institutions sort of think, well, the read access, we understand that the, the, the regulatory reasons behind that, but, you know, we don't want to hand over to, to an app, to, you know, a third party, you know, the ability to, um, you know, sign up customers and, and that sort of thing, for example, that for them read only is enough. Is, is, is that part of the tension in this or am I reading that the wrong way? I think maybe reading that the wrong way, you know, I, I, I think, I think the tension is just education, you know, honestly, you know, I think, you know, we are, um, you know, we're a fast following nation in Australia, you know, so if, if we can point to, that's why I was super excited by Combank coming out, actually, you know, honestly, that if, if, you know, the biggest of the big four is embracing open banking, well, then that's a good sign that, you know, maybe everybody else will start to, to look up to that. So, you know, it certainly meant that, you know, boardroom conversations we were having, um, try, you know, struggling to get to the yes um, on the contract, you know, we got to the yes really quickly because, you know, we were able to demonstrate there were more people in there and, that, and you know, we like to be safe, right? We know that everybody else is doing it, we'll, we'll get on board. And I think that's, you know, that's really the purpose of opportunities like this is to say, you know, there are a number of banks now in, you know, already going, you know, consider your options and, and start to, and start to attack it. Now, um, for data holders at this at this point that are, you know, as I said, probably on the precipice of, of, of going live or at least contemplating what that looks like for them um, over the next 12 and, and 24 months, if you had to think of the biggest reward in it for them, um, but also the biggest risk that's in it for them and, and also how that risk can be managed. Yeah. Um, well, I think the biggest risk is complacency, right? I think that, you know, in, you know with technology, it moves it moves so quickly, all of a sudden it, it's going really slow and then it's going quick, quick, quick. And, you know, you've missed your window. So I think, you know, complacency is probably the biggest risk, I think, you know, and, and disinformation. So not, not doing your research and not being across everything that's going on is, you know, probably the, the biggest risk because, you know, you won't know that Combank's launching a new app and what's it going to do, you know, and how it's going to compete with your customers until, until it's live, right? At which point you're 12 months away at best, you know, for launching something. So you've got to you've got to read the tea leaves a little bit and start to make those investments. I think for me, the biggest opportunities and all of the research we've done with you know all the banks and you know most of the banks in Australia have participated in some of our research would say that the aggregation of financial information is a, a safe bet. Essentially, bringing information into one place, using um, open banking data to inform. The lending decision you know we have a product called a financial passport which is you know your ability to bring all your financial information to one place and you know get approved to enter or not um and then um you know the, the concept of switching so one of the things we hear often is you know we spoke about it as retention but in the world in the world of language of compete you know is that we can see the product you're on today we can see how you're using that financial product and we can see if there's a better deal to be had in bank or with a partner of ours. Um, and so, I, you know, I think, you know, long-term, you know, we'll see banks start to specialize in areas that they really are good, you know, that the product that they've got is really comprehensive and, and market leading, and they'll start to dismiss those other products that they used to have 
because you needed to have it to be a bank. You needed to have credit cards. You needed to have all the, you know, a, a savings account, a transaction account, a mortgage. And we'll start to see organisations that really just specialise in, you know, in some or all of those, um, all of those products. So that I think we'll see new products being developed, you know, much faster and brought to market quicker, you know, because you know the competition is there. And what's the what's the experience like? Do you think for a, a customer in even fast forward five years from now? I know it's very hard to even think in increments like that. But how is their experience revolutionised? And what would you like to see them empowered to be able to do, um, regardless of, of of how this all fits together in about five years? I suppose it goes back to those values where you kicked off the the, the business from to begin with, right? Yeah. For, well, for me, absolutely. You know, I, I'm really you know I know what I I would like to see you know, people that understand their financial position at any point in time. They they know with absolute certainty that they're on the best deal for their circumstances at this point in time. Um, and that money is no longer the thing that they worry about. You know, so, you know, we, we stick with that feel good about money because, you know, I don't want to worry about money. I, I want to be, you know, maybe give me something else to worry about. We all like to worry about something. So, you know, it might be my waistline or it might be, you know, the climate, you know, it might be, you know, you know, we can sit, there's lots of things we can go and get busy doing, you know, let's use technology to educate, you know, because financial education is difficult, right? Financial empowerment is different. You know, the, the ability to give people the tools and to, you know, use technology to drive the experience, I think is very, you know, in five years time, we should absolutely be able to do that. So, um, you know, I would like to see those, you know, feel good things in place, as well as just better um, product experiences. You know, let's get rid of all the nonsense of T's and C's and everything else. Just be really simple language. This is the product. This is what it does. You understand it and it delivers on its promise. Um, you know, I worry about my I worry about my waistline, as you mentioned there, guys. So I'll keep my eye out for this for the side at Frollo on the side for 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 blokes like me. Um, I'd also like to say to people that that are viewing this afternoon, it's probably we're getting close to your last opportunity. If you do have any additional questions um, for Gareth, it's been an entertaining and interesting hour, and I'm I'm fascinated and I'm interested when we do look in in crystal balls, and it's really not all that far away that the, the type of of technology that you're doing, and you know I I, I look at it very much from a consumer perspective but as we are today from what it means for, uh, for for the financial institutions that are part of it and have to go along and and ride the crest of this wave uh, where does Australia fit you mentioned the UK um, model a, a moment ago where does Australia fit in terms of um, the pace of, of, of adaptability towards these sorts of things compared to other sort of similar and even bigger economies well, I think I think we're big in idea um, and we're slow in execution. How does that, um, you know, so, you know, the, the idea of what we're trying to achieve with the consumer data is huge. Um, and, and I think it's bigger than anybody else's ideas, um, you know, in terms of what we're, what we're tackling and what we're working on now. Um, but the, you know, the execution is, is slow, right? You know, we're just, just early days. You know, we probably lost 12 months you know, with, you know, COVID as well impacts, you know, all of those things where, you know, at a time we were trying to get momentum, we had, everybody had competing priorities with their lives, you know, the open banking wasn't at the top of the agenda for government or for anybody. And, and I think rightly so, but I think that that means that we've lagged a year. So we're probably two or three years behind the UK in terms of momentum, but the opportunity I think for, the, for Australia is, you know, to deliver on use cases and deliver more value per API call versus, um, you know, all I've done is move money from A to B, you know, what is the value you're trying to create with open banking? And I think that's where the opportunity lies that we, if we can, if we can get that right, you know, focus on value creation and, you know, valuable experiences, we'll have a more successful and vibrant um, CDR, you know, open banking ecosystem than anywhere else in the world. And as you said from the beginning, it's all about being purpose-driven, or at least it is for you. It's been a fascinating hour, Gareth. I really appreciate your time and, and sharing everything that you have. I'm sure it's raised a lot of issues, a lot of areas of interest for people that are, that are tuned in with us this afternoon. But it's been fabulous to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time this afternoon. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. No, thanks for having us today. And I'm going to throw back now, Gareth, to Christina Chu from Western Union Business Solutions to wrap everything up. But for everyone that has joined us this afternoon, from myself and from Gareth as well, we really appreciate your time and thanks for joining us. Christina. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth and Chris.
We will be sharing today's webinar recording with all our uh, FI clients. Um, please check your inbox in the coming day for this. And alternatively, you can contact your account manager. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.